people here. We go Kono, Naomi Raleigh, um, and they can take questions during, during the post. So um, since I see many new faces that I don't know, let me just briefly introduce. So um, I work at EPFL, the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology, and in my lab we're interested in systems with low dissipation. And, uh, and this is a pretty broad term, so we're interested in systems in particular optical nature and also mechanical systems, and how be, these can be used either in very fundamental kind of quantum measurements, which I'm going to tell you about today, and there our prime motivation is, um, is, is the quantum control of mechanical systems, understanding dissipation, and how you can make even, even lower dissipation systems. Um, and then we also look at, uh, uh, like a Janos had, and looking forward also to using some of these low uh, loss integrated photonics and in applications particular for, for frequency metrologies or, or, or even other devices that we hybridly integrate, such as with Niobate or, or MEMS. We, this field goes by hybrid integrated photonics. So what I'd like to tell you about today um, is, uh, this is my outline of my presentation, um, is really on some recent advances in making very coherent mechanical oscillators, um, and then motivated by some observations we're making with, with room temperature and low temperature mechanical systems, I want to talk about circuit optimal mechanical systems, which were already introduced actually yesterday by John Teufel. I want to use some of these ideas to circuit optimal mechanics, um, study first kind of the single particle system and then move towards lattices of, uh, of circuit optimal mechanical systems. So um, we have been very interested um, uh, for a number of years now um, on making very low loss mechanical oscillators. And what I'd like to tell you about is our kind of journey that started out uh, really with, with work from Albert Schlieser's groups in Copenhagen, uh, and also early work from Jack Harris, uh, and the beginning of the, of the, the 2000s, uh, Craig had, on making strength mechanical systems with low dissipation. And there's now a range of kind of new techniques, and I want to just highlight at the beginning some new techniques we developed that allow to make very compact, uh, very coherent mechanical oscillators by using strains materials such as silicon nitride. So, um, um, so a brief history of dissipation dilution. I apologize, I will not talk much about the physics, but I'd like to just show um, that it's really been an, uh, a quite astounding progress okay, over the last, uh, uh, last maybe 15 years. So it's plotted here is a mechanical quality factor of thin film strained mechanical oscillators, uh, starting, as I said, with observations from Jack Harris and Craig had on strained silicon nitride. Right? And, um, and, um, and the progress has been such that today we can have room temperature mechanical oscillators, which can be made in, in a week or two in the cleaner with very high yield and have quality factors of like three billion. And, um, and so it's really democratized access to this very coherent system. And it's been a progress of more than yeah, 30 dB, a factor of 1,000 kind of um, over, last, um, uh, over, last, uh, over last years. So what is the physics that is uh, being used? It's a physics of loss dilution. So the physics that you have a strain material that has an intrinsic Q, and where the loss is diluted by a geometrical factor that you can engineer by the geometry or by engineering strain. And, uh, and this allows you to get uh, systems that have either very high thermal core sensitivity, and we're going to talk about some of the prospects potentially of these systems for, for MRFN, but also they should have a very low thermal decoherence rate. And that's actually what I'm going to talk about in, in the second part of my talk. So um, the physics of uh, loss of dissipation dilution, let me just mention it very briefly, because I think it was already but uh, this goes back um, to original work on gravitation wave community and understanding kind of the dissipation and suspended test masses of LIGO. It was then understood that uh, the same physics that holds for gravitationally pulled strings also applies to actually strain silicon nitride resonators that have intrinsic deposition stress. And, uh, and the very important realization was the one actually of our conference chair, uh, um, Albert Lisa's group, that showed that if you kind of uh, do a soft clamping, that is to say, you you have to engineer the mode shape of the mechanical oscillator, you can suppress so-called clamping losses. And these are losses that are associated with a finite curvature at the anchor point. Now, this must not be a small actually change, it's actually quite dramatic, because the scaling of the curvature losses and the anchor losses, okay, they differ by a factor of the length of the oscillator divided by the height, so by many orders of magnitude. So by suppressing this, you can really boost the mechanical oscillator quality factor. This can be shown here by a one-dimensional system, say it's not a string, where you see that inside the band gap, where you start to apply the soft clamp, and you get an improvement by about a factor of 10. And this allowed in this early membrane work to increase the quality factor from about 10 to 7 to about, about 100 million. Now, uh, one very interesting question you can ask yourself is, okay, what is the limit of this technique? And one limitation is the material itself. And so, um, we started about five years ago, and this PhD really got Dr. Bakari, 
So you ask the question, can we use other materials? And ideally, you would like to use materials that have no two level systems. One example being crystal material. And so we got our hold on a wafer that came from Soitec. Uh, and this is a wafer that contains strained silicon. It's a material that was used actually to make high speed transistors uh, uh, some decades ago. It's actually faded out now. But uh, um, it has about above one gigapascal strained silicon, about 10 nanometer thick, on an oxide, again, on a conventional silicon wafer. And, um, and over the last years, um, we, uh, we figured out how to make soft clamps mechanical oscillators of these. And so you see, you see the same graph that I showed earlier. You see here uh, the frequency of the mechanical oscillator. You see the mechanical nodes outside the band cap have an innately higher Q at cryogenic temperature of about 100 nanometers already. And if you now apply the soft clamping, you see that the mode inside the defect achieved quality factor of, in this case, more than, uh, more than 10 billion okay, uh, at cryogenic temperature. So these are quite actually astounding values that shows you the potential of the technique and you can ask and dream now to take this device in a dilution refrigerator to remove the, the, the residual oxides and you probably uh, see an improvement of, um, of uh, even further. So you said these are devices that have thermal decoherence rates of about 10 hertz and also very high um, force sensitivities, even though again, it is challenging to, to use those devices in actual setting, but it's encouraging to see that they do have force sensitivity except in the root hertz. Now, another family of mechanical resonators um, uh, we developed over the last 15 years goes right back to one of my yeah, very bright PhD students, uh, Sergei Fedorov, who came up with the idea um, and to address one challenge of soft clamp devices, um, and that is the question, can you apply soft clamping to a fundamental mode? So soft clamping implies that you have a band cap, and typically it's a very high order modes of a string okay, that are soft clamp. And this um, creates still an environment where you see the upper and lower paths band some mechanical noise leaking into the band cap, creating a, a measurement. And so he asked the question, can we make a structure where you soft clamp the fundamental? And he came up um, with this beautiful idea of an hierarchical structure. So it's a fractal. So it's a beam kind of that splits into, you know, kind of splits into the vertical. And what Sergey showed is that these structures have fundamental modes that are soft clamp. So thereby can um, um, work in a, in a frequency range that is not congested. And these structures uh, um, have, again, also very good quality effects of room temperature, about close to one billion at room temperature. In this case, it's lower frequencies, about hundreds of kilohertz, a cryogenic temperature above a billion. And uh, what was, um, again, a beautiful conspiracy of, uh, maybe a beautiful uh, coincidence was that uh, by the time uh, we were, uh, certainly was thinking about how to implement devices in two dimensions, um, so membranes, we came up with this kind of steering wheel bed design, we used the same principle of hierarchical structures. And there was a paper that appeared about the same time actually uh, on archive from a group of Sig Sigmund uh, in, in Denmark, who was studying topology optimization using numerical techniques, so brute force kind of calculations, what's the optimum structure. And so they turned out to find numerically, okay, that fractals actually possess also this property of soft clamp. So it was a very nice coincidence of, of one case, the very nice idea of Sergey and the topology optimization from Sigma that allowed actually to come up with these uh, novel designs. Okay, um, also here again, they have very low kind of uh, thermal decoherence rates at both room temperature and also cryogenic temperature. So um, uh, now um, an even kind of more striking structure, um, again, goes back to, to some ideas that, that Sergey Fedorov um, had, and that is, um, what is the, can you um, make structures that um, are more compact? So the hierarchical structures and the soft clamp structures, all structures that are kind of millimeter scale in size, which creates challenges in terms of building the device to release them in the game. And so you can ask yourself the question, what is the ultimate limit okay, of the mechanical quality factor? And the ultimate limit is, um, so to speak, an infinite beam, a clampless limit. And the infinite beam and the clampless limit its uh, mechanical quality effect only depends on the thickness, okay, the frequency you're looking at, density, and then actually the strain you have in your hand. And so, of course, you can't make an infinite kind of infinitely long string, but what you can do is you can wrap the string around itself. And so it came up with this beautiful kind of structure, just a very simple, okay, uh, uh, in this case, uh, a structure of uh, composed of four beams that are okay, held by joints, you can make five or six. And uh, so the mechanical modes are so-called perimeter modes, and these are innately soft clamped. Okay, they're also kind of uh, fundamental, low frequency mode in the spectrum. And uh, they approach actually the, uh, uh, very closely the infinite clamp limit within a factor of two. 
And so what's kind of um, beautiful is that these devices could have been made probably already a decade ago. They're not particularly difficult. You can make them in a clean room in two weeks. And they give quality factors, in this case, of 3 billion, about 3 billion at room temperature, uh, just by silicon nitride. And so now you can, of course, ask yourself, okay, can you do this maybe in strain silicon? And yes, you would probably even get higher cues if we were to do that cryogenically. So um, this has given us kind of this new map of devices. So we can have soft clamping, we can have uniform beams, we can have binary trees, we can have perimeter mode. And, uh, and uh, yeah, I'm very curious in the next years, and maybe two years at this conference, to learn about all the other maybe structures that we don't know yet. Okay, now I'd like to switch to the second part of my presentation. There's a question, um, can we apply some of these uh, ideas to make maybe also higher mechanical oscillators in the vacuum gap capacitors? And the vacuum gap capacitors have been introduced by, uh, by John Ray at this conference, and it's a really fascinating platform for quantum optical mechanical. Uh, they have many desirable properties, such as being resolved type and resolved, it's middle Kelvin temperatures, uh, uh, large optical mechanical coupling. Um, and so the question that we ask ourselves is, can we, um, first of all, increase kind of the, the, uh, the quality factors of these devices? And also, can we increase, and this may be a very technical question, but will become evident in this talk, can we make them more reproducible? So what do I mean by reproducibility? So first of all, it is a spectacularly successful platform. So many, many uh, beautiful experiments uh, have been shown in the past and are being shown okay, for many groups around the world that work with these vacuum gap capacitors. But generally making them is, 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 is challenging. And the typical fabrication method has been that uh, one releases a, a suspended drum, this release process um, in many cases can create top plates that are not kind of flat. Play music instruments, you of course know that the best way to make a very high Q drum okay, is to, to make sure that you have the drum is both under tension and also kind of flat. And so, what we want to address is some of these uh, challenges uh, to make actually uh, the microwave frequencies very controllable, to make the mechanical frequencies very controllable, and also very, very low loss. And I'd like to turn, first talk actually about the, uh, the low losses. So, um, so, we revise a new fabrication process, and, uh, and it's always a bit um, Unfortunate to just devote one slide to it, uh, but I want to do that. Um, so the fabrication process that we are, uh, it took actually quite a lot of time actually to set to figure this process out. So what we're doing is we're taking a substrate in the recess, depositing the bottom plate, and we're filling it with a sacrificial layer, and then the top plate, and then we release it. And what sounds very easy is compounded by the fact that you can at least take three materials, okay, as a superconductor, you take three materials, okay, as a sacrificial layer, another three for the substrate. So there's a lot of combinations to make. And so we figured actually in the end that the best combination actually was to keep aluminum, take SR2 sector frequency, and uh, silicon as our substrate. Oh, sorry, I need to keep it closer. Silicon as our substrate. And so the uh, result of this uh, has been that we can actually have uh, gap control that is, is what we call lithographically defined, that is to say it's actually very precise in these systems. And, um, and so what we can do next is we can kind of investigate the thermomechanical properties of these uh, electromechanical systems. And the first is to just um, uh, measure the mechanical frequency. One of the uh, desirable properties of the system is that we have very accurate control actually over the frequency. So in this case, you see here the trench radius as a function of the mechanical frequency. And you can see here uh, that by sweeping the radius of the disk, actually, you see a very, very nice kind of inverse radius dependence as we would expect for the system, and very little scatter. So we can dial in by lithography our mechanical frequency. Now the second question, of course, you ask yourself is, okay, in these systems now that have a flat top plate, when you cool them down, our attention, can you benefit of some improvement in the mechanical coherence? Okay, and, uh, and in order to do that, we can design the system and, and, and measure ring down. And in this system, what we found is that by already applying very moderate improvements actually to a top plate, by moderate, I mean in this case, a technique which is called Clamp tapering. We improve the quality factors actually of these devices uh, from about below a million to 40 million. So, compared to say the much of the earlier work, as also pointed out yesterday by John, it's improved by yeah, nearly two orders of magnitude, the mechanical quality factors. Um, and so, it's really now millihertz kind of frequency. Also, they are still uh, well thermalizing, and also we obtain quite decent kind of optimal mechanical coupling rates of over 25. So the uh, next question we asked ourselves is, okay, how, how, um, what is the thermal decoherence of the system? In order to directly um, uh, measure the thermal decoherence of the system, what we want to do is first ground situ mechanical oscillator and see actually how it heats up out of the ground. Situ. So to directly access this first instance, 
okay, where it heats out of the ground state, which tells you how, how fast quanta etching from the environment. And so this, again, uh, was introduced by John yesterday to use side-band cooling. Okay, in our case, we have one strong cooling channel, we have two uh, rear probes, uh, one on the red side, one on the blue side, they both scatter photons inside the cavity. Okay, and if you have uh, very little cavity occupation, so excess photons inside the cavity, then um, what you can do is you can uh, uh, measure directly the side band asymmetry in the scattered Stokes and any Stokes side band and uh, measure the occupancy of the mechanical so preparing the, the system. Now, um, one compounding effect I want to point out is that you have to really understand your measurement chain precisely and also understand actually the cavity occupation that you have. Because in many of the microwave experiments, when you start driving the cavity, it starts actually to create a non-zero sum. And so um, um, we have been very fortunate um, to have that access via the AFSOR and also Lincoln Lab to so-called uh, JAWS and uh, traveling wave parametric amplifiers which allows you to make a quantum limited readout chain for the mechanism. And these devices are wide band, so the bandwidth encompasses uh, several gigahertz. They can have gain more than 20, uh, 20 dB, and also they operate very close to the quantum. And so in one of these devices we actually placed actually inside our measurement chain. So just before our hand amplifier, about eight quanta per second per hertz of noise, um, uh, to um, get a faithful measurement okay, of the mechanical motion, and also these very weak thermomechanical sidebands. So let's first uh, look actually how well this readout chain works. So thanks to the uh, two plot that we have included in our measurement, okay, we could reduce uh, the background noise in our measurement to just above 1.8 quanta per second per hertz. So the ideal measurement is 2.5 or something limited. Um, and uh, and uh, this is already a significant improvement compared to our earlier work where we just had access to a hand band. Now, um, if you have the, 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 the two plot, one thing you can look at actually is when you start cooling the, uh, the cavity, um, and you look not at the thermomechanical motion of the mechanical oscillator, but just the cavity itself, what you see is that the cavity starts heating up. And this is called cavity heat. Cavity heat. Now with this tuba, we can very uh, carefully measure what that uh, cavity heating is. And in this case, what we found it out for uh, yeah, the vacuum gap systems with this uh, engineer kind of gap, we found that even for the very high cooperativity, well above 1,000 actually, we see very little heating in this case, that corresponds to the total five quanta. So the systems actually uh, um, gladly behave in such a way that we have little kind of uh, excess heating from the, uh, from the intercavity bath that we're creating when we drive this. Now, uh, just one very brief, mo uh, brief moment about calibration. It's a kind of science in itself. The way we actually calibrate it here in this case with the TUPA is like to look at this noise improvement ratio of NRI, which you can then actually see and infer uh, what the noise figure is um, of your of your of the of your entire measurement, and also a noise figure of the tuba, which here in this case was about 0.8. Now, uh, two more little comments um, that I want to mention. What we kind of found out uh, uh, also, uh, one is we found out that there's very low heating rates of the cavity uh, that we observed. Um, we said 0.05 in the high cooperativity regime. We're largely due to the fact that we removed actually the, uh, in our deposition and the contact between layers that we used in the process. Um, we found out that we removed actually from the aluminum, the aluminum oxide, um, uh, which we can get uh, using IVE in our, inside our plastic system, we see a reduction uh, by almost an order of magnitude in the cavity. So that was an important kind of serendipitous observation. There. Another point I want to kind of advertise is that for many of the experiments, uh, we use microwave synthesizers, but these have finite phase noise. Typically, you know, high end English wards will come in at minus 140 dBc. But the limit for uh, many of the experiment is genome squared over thermal decoherence, and that can be still uh, substantially lower than what commercial phase noise and uh, commercial sources give you. And so we developed a little uh, project over the years, and that's a, a fully tunable kind of uh, filter cavity. And so for those in the audience and doing these experiments, uh, we made an open science hardware project where we uh, published not just the, the paper, but also actually the, the hardware, the code. And uh, these devices can tune to any kind of arbitrary frequency in about a one gigahertz bandwidth. Have 20 dB of suppression and also automatically adjust the, the critical coupling to knock out the phase noise. So it's very technical, but, but these things are, are incredibly practical when you have them. We've now built, I think, four or five of these. Okay, with these kind of techniques in place, let me just uh, uh, mention indeed these very highly coherent mechanical oscillators. You can cool very efficiently, and maybe less surprisingly, um, if you now do the experiments I mentioned, you take the cooling tone, you take the probe, two probe sideband, you see the N and plus one scattering. And what we observe is that we pump the system strongly. We start uh, uh, taking cooperativity from 200 to about 4,000. What you see is, um, you see that uh, the 
first of sort of to have siphon asymmetry appear. If you pump too hard, what you observe is squashing on the pump laser, in this case, a pump tone, and you see the siphon asymmetry, okay, starting to increase, decrease again, you're heating up. And from this, we can obtain kind of the minimum occupancy, and the minimum occupancy experiment was about 0.07, limited again by the, by the battery. So um, we can prepare these very highly coherent mechanical systems very close to the mechanical ground state, and now we can look at how the system is thermally, deco thermally decoheres, so how it heats out. And why we were interested to measure this, we want to find out if these very high mechanical cues also translate into a lower thermal decoherence rate, which evidently is also um, uh, describing your coupling to the environment. Okay, so um, how does this measurement work? Um, we use here a technique, actually, that's been pioneered by Conrad, um, which is not uh, to use the TUPA, but rather use a transient amplification. So the idea here is to first cool the oscillator in the ground state, then actually apply a blue siphon pulse to amplify the mechanical motion, and uh, do this measurement for variable times between ground state preparation and readout. And, um, and so each of these readout traces okay, gives you a, uh, a signal that's, that's here, it gives you an I signal and Q signal, so two quadratures. Uh, that's exponentially rising. We can now project those in a temporary function. You get one value for the i, one value for the q, and you plot those in a scatter plot. Okay, and uh, now um, what is very important is that the optomechanical amplification itself also adds noise. Um, and uh, we have actually, we can also exactly precise how much noise that is. And the way we do that is we first prepare the mechanical oscillator in a low occupancy state. So here we can look at the siphon symmetry anywhere between, say, one and four quanta. It's there where the siphon symmetry actually works best. Now, actually, we amplify. Uh, this is the beautiful aspect about this optimal amplification. You can have very high gain. In our case, it was 45 dB. Uh, and, uh, so, um, in this case, when we now plot the variance, actually, of our IMQ signals in a scatter plot, okay, and, and trace the variance as a function of the number of occupancy here, then we can find out, actually, what the intercept is and the added noise. And this measurement is about 1.2 quanta. So, unfortunately, we see that, actually, the readout this actually is not quantum limited, and we understand why. If you're interested, we can talk to you and tell you why that is. Now, still, we know the noise that we're adding in the measurement. We can subtract the noise out and, uh, and, uh, and look at now how the mechanical oscillator kind of starts to decohere. And so, this is an example here where we look over, in this case, 10 milliseconds. Okay. Um, and, uh, sorry, 10 seconds. We start to see here that the long time limit we reach be about 250 quanta that we should have a steady state. When we're thermalizing actually with our fridge, again, the mechanical oscillator here is about a megahertz. And if we now zoom into this very early region here, what we see is we can directly measure thermal decoherence. In this case, the thermal decoherence rate is just about six milliseconds. And so how does it compare okay, to the thermal decoherence rate that we would expect from our ring down measurement? Well, there's a bit of a discrepancy by more than a factor of two. Um, so the nominal one that we would expect is a 250 quantum environment, and the measured kind of energy relaxation is about 10. So there's a slight difference which we attribute to the fridge heating when we apply these actually pulsed operations. But still it shows that we can substantially increase actually the thermal decoherence okay, of these electromechanical systems now really into the millisecond. Now um, um, another experiment you can do and that we were interested in doing uh, is not watch the, uh, the ground state kind of decohere, relax in a steady state with the environment, but we want to look what happens if you create a squeeze state. And this um, can be realized using a scheme that we all of you know very well. This is a bit of squeezing scheme where you apply both a red and blue sideband with slightly different intensities okay, to the upper and lower sideband. In this case, the, the state you relax into okay, is not a, a ground state, but rather it's the squeeze state of the, of the system. And so and we repeat the experiment. So we prepare the mechanical oscillator in the ground state, but now applying again this red and blue sideband kind of simultaneously. And then after a certain pre-evolution time, we again apply the same technique, this trend amplification. Again, it's a phase insensitive amplification that we're using that's where we're adding noise in the measurement. And that we know what the amount of noise is that we're adding. And uh, so we're subtracting it from the measurement error. And so what we observe here, the full measurement, okay, the red here is the one that I've refracted. And from the subtraction, we can reconstruct the squeezing we have in the system, which in this case, t time t equals zero is about five dB. And uh, as we let the system relax now, what we observe is that the squeezing is preserved until about two milliseconds. And here, you see directly kind of the squeeze state relax, okay, into, into thermal equilibrium and uh, preserve its heat properties for the first two milliseconds. So this was a 
really a, a, a beautiful kind of measurement series we could do thanks to the tupa that helped us to ascertain actually what the, the ground cell occupation is, and thanks to this method actually of transidentification that really completely overcomes the noise that you add. Okay, um, in the last part, the last five minutes, I'd like to um, now go one step further. Now that we have these mechanical oscillators that are very kind of well controlled and also um, they have large uh, quality factors, low thermal decoherence, um, we wanted to look can we um, look at other dynamics beyond kind of the single optomechanical, so beyond the single particle. And, uh, and so we've been kind of um, hoping to study some, some multi mode circuit optomechanics for, for, for a long time. There's a beautiful set of work actually from Florian Marker and other authors. Um, what you can study if you had uh, chains of optomechanical systems. And these circuit optomechanical systems are really ideal for, for the very reason that they're very compact, they're photographically fabricated, and you can easily achieve inductive coupling between cells. And so, um, so the first kind of system that we, uh, we want to study is a very kind of a simple system, the so called SSH model. It's a very simple topological model where you have a 1D chain. Uh, yeah, the chain is composed of intercell coupling, intracell coupling. And you don't hear J1 and J2. And, um, and this um, SSH model has well known edge states, okay, in a topological space. And uh, it, has, it has a basic gap, an open gap in the, in the phase one. So um, now there's a whole kind of beautiful, extremely rich physics behind these edge states. And uh, in fact, you can predict the existence of an edge state okay, of the SSH model by even looking at an infinite system by looking at the sort of bulk, bulk boundary correspondence. And by computing a bulk property, in this case, the winding number or a Zach phase, the, the Zach phase is, in this case, pi, we know that the winding number is one if there are edge states. Now, um, I want to touch much on the, on the physics, even though for the 1D system, it's really well known, it's kind of textbook knowledge. But now, what I'd like to highlight is what are the differences by introducing optimal. And so here, what we have is not just a mechanical, not just an electromagnetic mode that are coupled into a cell, but we have also mechanical And these mechanical oscillators, in principle now, we can either make them fully degenerate, I'm not going to talk about this today, but what you can actually do is also, you can make each of these mechanical oscillators a different frequency. And you can label kind of each side. And so what this implies then is that, uh, um, that in the uh, diagonalized kind of Newtonian, you have uh, basically bulk boats, you have upper, upper pass band, lower pass band, and the edge states that are coupled, okay, to all the mechanical modes of your of, of the drum. So you distribute the coupling by uh, coupling all the cells in your, in your system. So what you have then is, uh, uh, in the electromagnetic domain, shown the upper part here, you have an upper pass band, lower pass band, edge state, and then you have a transition to a topological trivial phase that doesn't have any edge states. And the edge states themselves, they are somatic and asymmetric superposition of, of energy residing in the last okay, part of the chain, um, and also they bleed into the bulk, obeying the chiral symmetry, only the, the even number of resonators. Now the difference to the conventional SSH model is now that we also have these mechanical modes. Okay, so they're not, they are coupled now to all the modes actually of the band structure. And what you in principle now can do is you can probe okay, the, uh, uh, the mode shapes okay, of the bulk and also of the edge modes by looking at the optomechanical coupling. And so, um, and so, so we fabricated such a device um, using this. Uh, so this is the one D SSH chain. In this case, it has five unit cells, so 10, 10 devices. They're coupled inductively. The, the coupling here is again staggered by changing the gap between the different inductive elements. And we operate the system here in topological phase where edge states are. And so you see here the upper pass band, lower pass band. You see two edge states, and these edge states here, in this case, are split because the two wave functions or mode functions are overlapping, they're hybridizing, and they're giving you a symmetric and asymmetric superposition action. Last cycle. We can also now look into the mechanical modes, and we see, okay, for instance, to Omit, we observe now here all the 10 mechanical modes, okay, that we have in the SSH chain. We have labeled each of these. Now, um, uh, what can you do, kind of, as a, as a first kind of example of this optimal Dynamics. Well, what you can do is you can use the optomechanical interaction to precisely measure okay, what the mode shapes are of the upper pass band, lower pass band, and the edge state. So how much okay, electromagnetic energy resides in each of the vacuum gap capacitors. The way you can do that is simply by using the optomechanical physics 
um, of, of the mechanical cooling. So you can look okay, how each of these collected modes or, or, or dialyzed modes of the field is coupling to each individual mechanical. And if you look at that coupling, it's not the usual four genome squared over kappa expression, but there's a little eta here. And this is the participation ratio of the mode you're looking at on a certain side. Okay, so for instance, if you look okay, at the at bulk modes, okay, you had a symmetric bulk mode that had occupation that was equal for all the, all the sides, okay, then in fact, uh, the system would be one over n where n is one. Now by measuring okay, for each a mode of the electronic system, the participation ratio of each mechanical mode, you can fully reconstruct, in fact, the, uh, the, the mode shapes of the, uh, okay? And so for the 1D system, um, what you end up with um, is the mode shapes in the bulk, the mode shapes of, and also the mode shapes in the edge states, which again have this chiral symmetry, so the vanishing uh, occupation inside, and you see also that the two edges are overlapping, which explains why they're split now. Now, um, one uh, very interesting variation of the experiments you can do, you can see it by Shingo Kono, who's also here at the, at the, the poster today, is you can use the combination of the mode shapes together okay, with the eigenfrequency to construct the full coupling monotony, the full coupling matrix of the 1D system. So in the 1D system, it's still quite easy, but still we have 10 unit cells, so we have a 10 by 10 Hamiltonian here. And um, what we have seen by taking the eigenfrequency electronic modes together with the eigenvectors whose square magnitude is determined, you can obtain the, the full coupling Hamiltonian. You can see here, for instance, that there's not just nearest neighbors coupling that you would expect, but also next neighbors. So if you look at the diagonal, it tells actually how many frequency fluctuations you have in our microwave cavity. In this case, this is less than 0.5%. So this is kind of the 1D system, and, uh, and we asked ourselves, okay, can we make something even more complex? So can we go to two dimensions? And in two dimensions, there's a, a, a beautiful, remarkable literature about the honeycomb lattice, uh, lattice that has staggered coupling. And this model of staggered coupling in a honeycomb lattice is uh, called the strain graphene model. So if you have graphene, it has Dirac cones. If you apply strain you know, actually to one direction, what happens is that one direction, the, the, um, the, uh, you lose the, the Dirac cone, you actually get a gap. So it's just, you get the density of states actually has a band gap, or the orthogonal direction will still retain. Behavior. And so in this system, there's a very rich history that goes back to Willard Dresselhaus at MIT that predicted the existence actually of edge states on graphene ribbons, so sheets of graphene. And uh, in the case of ribbon, okay, uh, there's an interesting kind of observation in graphene. In fact, it depends actually on how the graphene ribbon is terminated. Because if it has a so-called zigzag termination or armchair termination, in one case it will exhibit edge states, in one case it won't. So what we fabricated was a uh, 24 sides uh, strain graphene flake. And this is, so to speak, the, the smallest uh, system you can possibly make. So it has actually two phases. It's had one phase that is zigzag, one actually that is armchair. And the prediction of the graphene uh, uh, physics is that along kind of this uh, armchair, there's no edge states that form, but only along the zigzag. And so now we can again take the exact same technique of, uh, of the mechanical mode shape spectroscopy, reconstruct the mode shapes, and then see if we observe edge states. And so in this system, uh, again, we have, uh, uh, so we've made, made from these 24 cells, we see the lower pass band, the upper pass band. We now see uh, four kind of edge modes, okay, they're, they're also hybridized uh, fully, so it's, it's splitting. And uh, what we can do now is, again, apply the same technique. So we drive a certain uh, uh, mode of the electronic environment, so in this case, either lower pass band or the edge mode. And now we interrogate and look how the optimal mechanical coupling, say, at this lower side is. And again, each of these mechanical, each of the uh, uh, sides here is labeled. So we have 24 different kind of mechanical frequencies. Now we can step through the entire kind of flake and reconstruct. Uh, and what you observe is um, shown here. So we have the bulk modes that we observe. These are reconstructed mode shapes. We can also uh, look again at the measurements, but also compare the theory. We do this for the, the upper pass band. Lower pass. And what we see in the middle here are the edge states. And so the edge states in graphene, just as predicted from conventional theory, um, are in fact forming only on the edge that is zigzag, not on the edge that is. That is. And so we see this in our measurements. We also see that we have, don't have a fully hybridized, only partially hybridized kind of edge states. 
but that's consistent also with our redundant simulations, not completely with our simulations that we predict here fully, fully habitats. Now, the same idea that, uh, um, so here's more time, this, this physics uh, of these edge states. So in the case of has mentioned, if you had a, a ribbon, a flake, there's one edge that is called zigzag, one edge that is armchair. In one case, uh, you would support edge states in the case of zigzag, but in the case of armchair, in fact, you don't. So you, uh, there's no edge that's appearing inside the armchair. So here, one more time, there's the edge modes that we measured and that the experimental regions. So it's kind of an example of how we use this, this optimal mechanical interaction to kind of do kind of a, a first step into a new direction of, of using it to measure the properties of the microwave. Now this has been attempted before. However, um, these techniques are typically invasive, either using a scanning probe or even laser-based um, kind of reconstructing the hemisphere of state. Now the same technique of reconstruction of Hamiltonian you can also apply to this 24 sub flake. So here again, we know the eigenfrequencies of the ligand. We've measured uh, the square magnitude of the eigenvector components. From this, again, reconstruct the full hemoglobin. And it's, uh, in this case, uh, it's quite a laborious technique. Again, it automated it to increase the efficiency of the data taking. And this shows here the 24 sites that we have. Uh, we see the nearest neighbor coupling, but we also see the second neighbor coupling. And again, the diagonal gives us the fluctuations in the microwave resonance. Which is less than 0.5. Okay, with this, I'd like to uh, um, yeah, stop. The chairman tells me. And uh, I'd like to mention, I think there's another there's a lot of interesting science that hopefully will come. Uh, we're interested in doing uh, look at collective dynamics, collective cooling, and also um, please visit the post of Shingo Kono, who joined from the Lakamura group, who is uh, bringing his expertise on qubits. I'm going to couple these actually to the supercharging circuits. And uh, we have already promised to resolve some. Long coherence time in the qubits that Shingo brought that we like to combine with these very coherent mechanical systems. Thank you very much. Thank you, Niels. Thanks, Niels. Uh, um, we are asked to be better on time, probably I must be better on time.